Hi, I'm Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. My guest today is Dr. Karen Purvis, Director of the Institute of Child Development at Texas Christian University, where she and her colleagues develop research-based interventions for at-risk children. Dr. Purvis is also the co-author of The Connected Child, a book that has helped countless adoptive and foster parents better connect with their children who've come from hard places. This never-before-published conversation was recorded in September 2010. Welcome to Family Confidential, Karen. Thanks. It's great to be here with you, Annie. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, well, thank you for making time with us today because I know you're really, really busy doing your great work. I want to also thank you for writing this book. I was, I was very moved by it. My passion has always been children and families. And tell you the truth, um, I didn't have a lot of contact with kids growing up who were adopted, and nor do I have very many friends, only one that I can think of that has brought adopted children into their family. So this was all new information for me. And you write about children who come from the hard place, and you call them um, unattached children. And I'd like to start off with your definition of the unattached child, please. Well, you know, Annie, a child who comes from a place where maybe they've been harmed. It could be even prenatal harm but or postnatal harm. They, they have had tremendous wounding in their capacity to trust. And so they very often come to us with pain and fear and confusion. And, and it's very difficult for them, very challenging for them, to trust themselves into the care of another individual. We have some children who've been home as little ones, three and four years, and have never yet closed their eyes to go to sleep in their mother's arms. They're afraid to trust. Well, that's really interesting. You know, we think about the whole idea of trust and bond as maybe something that's inborn, but the truth is it's learned, isn't it? It is learned. You know, we we come desiring connection. When you look at a brand newborn baby, you can show them all kinds of cute toys or the face or put that to one side and a a face to the other side and and they much rather look at the face. We're we're made for connection, but it's going to take life experiences that empower that connection to a real trust connection and an attachment bond. Or maybe in the other direction when they've had experience learning not to trust. Exactly. Then we have children who look at us with the eyes that they looked at others with, and they're they're always seeing the risk. So they've generalized that all adults are um, to be distrusted. They they really have. You know, the part of the brain that says there's danger here gets hyperactivated in many of our kids, and that little um, that little part of the brain just keeps pumping away. It doesn't have reason. It doesn't have logic. It doesn't say, well, that was only my mother, my biological mother who was a drug addict and, mm-hmm. you know, got out of control, but it's just there's danger. Wow. I mean, what an awful image you just planted in my mind of a child who has yet to close their eyes to go to sleep because they just don't feel safe. Yeah, how heartbreaking yes, is this? Really? It? So these children who are unattached and, and come into a, a home that's just filled with love, just waiting to help them heal from these situations, they these parents have a lot on their plate, don't they? They certainly do. And very often they try the strategies that they've used maybe with a biological child or they see their friends using with their children. And then these parents who are, as you say, so truthfully, just brimming with love for this child, just so ready to meet their needs, are baffled and confused. And so your book is filled with really wonderful strategies. I I was so impressed. It was, like I said, I don't have a lot of experience in this area, but um, I'm I'm a very pragmatic woman too. And when I do parent education, the step by step really puts a parent at ease because if you start identifying situations that are problematic, if you red flag them ahead of time, and give parents the tools right there to deal with them, then they're no longer, what am I going to do? Oh my goodness, this is out of control. And they may feel that way anyway, but they can literally open a page in your book and say, oh, okay, 
This is going to make it better. Oh, thanks for those kind words, Annie. Our greatest hope was that parents would feel empowered for their journey. There was one particular scenario that jumped out at me that just seemed like such a simple solution. And yet in that moment of panic, when your kid is acting out, that what is simple can often elude us. What I'm talking about is is the example of the mom at the end of the day. This is a wonderful bonding time. Mom and, and child are in the kitchen. She's making dinner and child gets hungry and says, can I have a snack bar? And it's 10 minutes before dinner and mom says, no, sweetheart, we're going to eat in 10 minutes. And the child goes ballistic, literally. And, and as you describe it, runs to the room, sobbing, slams the door and is inconsolable. And there is, whoa, that was an overreaction. What, <laughs> yes. what is mom to do? Yes, yes. Well, and you know, it's so hard for a parent to look at the behavior in this moment. And I mean, that's obviously an overreaction by a little one. Mm-hmm. But what this mother was to learn over time was that this child remembered begging for food in an orphanage and being refused. And so what she learned to do was to frame her answers to her child and then to understand her child's responses in relation to the child's history rather than to this moment. So in these kinds of things, especially I'm thinking in public. <laughs> oh, oh goodness, yes. Yes, where, where you know, the, the reaction to the observers, the response oh, oh. is always, oh, what a terrible parent. Or yes. what, what a bratty child. Oh, yes. So you've got that extra layer of stress. <laughs> yes, just... yes. And we've had parents report, you know, I was in the grocery store and, and a mother in front of me said this really unkind thing to me. And, and clearly, if you, haven't, if you haven't loved a child from the hard places before, it's hard to understand why these reactions are so prevalent. So one thing that we encourage parents to do, Annie, is to stay at home for a while when their child first comes home. If one parent could take off from work, well, if, if two parents could, it would be fabulous. But if, if at least one parent could be at home, even if you have to take like a leave of absence from work or or maybe even take out a really small loan at the bank to cover a month or two salary and, and cover being at home just to meet whatever needs have to be met so that a child can begin to learn strategies for getting their needs met and you can begin to learn the tempo of the child. Mm-hmm. Um, just having that alone time in the early parts of a relationship can be very powerful. I'm sure for the whole family, especially if there are siblings involved, and yes. this is a huge transition. This is a new family we're creating here based on the family we started with. Absolutely. And Andy, you know, one thing that comes to mind for me that I think is so important, if you think about a newborn child, they cry, they, their cry says, I'm hungry. Mother says, yes, I will give you food. They cry, their mother hears their, hung, their cry. She says, you're cold. Uh, yes, I will give you warmth. And, and a mother and a daddy in a loving relationship with their baby, their newborn, say yes a hundred thousand times in the first year of life or more. So yes, I will feed you. Yes, I will hold you. Yes, I will cradle you. Yes, I will dry your diaper. Now a seven-year-old comes into our home. And the first thing that happens is he's on a tirade about something that we don't even understand, like the food. Mm-hmm. And so it's really hard for us to think about this, but we try to teach parents, think about how the yeses build the trust. Hmm. So, for example, in the case of the little girl who's asking for a candy bar, the mother could have said and learned to say that night, yes, baby, you can have this candy bar and you can put it by your plate or or in your pocket and you can eat it right after dinner. Now, see, that little girl was afraid she was going to be hungry. But the mother gave her not only uh, the, the yes, I'm going to meet your need, but she also gave her evidence, I'm going to meet her need. So here's the candy bar. That's your evidence. You're not going to die of starvation. And you have possession of it. That gives you power. Mm-hmm. And so this parent of a child who misbehaves in the store or has a fit over a, a, a candy bar at, at dinner time, if the parent can learn to reframe thinking about early development and what this child missed, yes, I can meet that need and we can do it right after such and such. This makes perfect sense. And in the Definitely. calm in the calm moment, the calm, quiet moment while I'm reading your book and maybe my child is being <laughs> occupied with, I hear you. Yes. with another adult, uh, this, is, this is perfect. And I yet, 
you know, yes. a screaming child um, pushes my buttons. And like I said, if we're in a grocery store, then I've got the added stress of people watching me and judging me. Yes. So it it's it's really challenging. Now, you know, what you just said, Karen, brings up another question for me. It's not like these children come with a full dossier so no. that we can know exactly what deprivations they exactly. had to deal with. So this is kind of a mystery solving process, isn't it? It really is, and parents become the greatest detectives. Um, and, and, you know, even if there is a history available, we all know that those histories are sometimes moved around so many times that they're, that they're not something you can put much weight on. Or maybe fabricated? Yes, yes, <laughs> they may be complete fabrications. Mm-hmm. They may be complete fabrications. And so we ask parents just to assume Your child is going to, there's some assumptions to make, and then there's some expectations to make. So the assumptions to make, just assume that if your child is coming home from hard places, they've got differences in their ability to trust. They've got differences in their ability to understand sensory data. That means if they weren't held carefully, lovingly, nurturing, and touched frequently with affectionate caresses, the parts of the brain that understand senses didn't mature. And so now when you touch a child, they may yank their hand back or they yank their shoulder back. They pull away from your kiss. And and so understand they're probably going to have some sensory changes. They most definitely have brain chemistry changes. I've seen brain chemistry tests called neurotransmitter tests on over a thousand adopted and foster kids. And and quite frankly, the, the, the chemistries are are dramatically altered. And then we have brain development changes and the capacity to trust from their life experiences. So just assume all of that dynamite is embedded in the history of this little person that you're going to make a path for. Now, as a great detective, watch for these signs. So if you ask a child if they want to do something and they get irritable or agitated or confused or they need more time, you can assume that the brain development that helps them think quickly through a question and answer it hasn't occurred. So they may need a little more time. You might even need to say, do you want to think about that? And let me know in a few minutes. So, I mean, you know, Annie, I'm sure you know this about brain development. We've got so much incredible information on brain development right now. But for example, a child who's got prenatal or postnatal trauma is going to have changes in the corpus callosum, that division between the right and the left hemisphere. So if a child doesn't have changes in the corpus callosum that connects those hemispheres, you ask them a question, the right brain asks the left brain, they make a decision and they tell you the answer. But if you've got a child that's got a, a wall there or the lack of colossum there, corpus callosum tissue that's appropriately connected, you ask them a question and the right brain doesn't know what, how to get to the left brain. Mm-hmm. And when he finally gets over to the left brain, the left brain can't get back to the right brain. And, and the decision process is profoundly delayed. All of this takes patience and and, and time and more patience and more time and a calm approach which just I mean I this speaks to all parents 21st century parents not just parents who are who are adopting parents I think this would be an excellent time for you if you would please read this passage from your book on page 18 which really talks about taking time good I'd love to read it thank you It says, as parents whip through these hectic days, children expected to just tag along, absorb life lessons, and feel connected to their family. But an at-risk, attachment-challenged child just won't get it. Adopted and foster children need lots of individualized, focused time with their parents in order to catch up on developmentally and to form close and loyal family bonds. It can be tough for the fast lane parents to reconcile that their at-risk children will need continual support and guidance to keep them moving in the right direction. Children who come from hard places don't overcome their history in six weeks. It can take years before new, improved life skills and attachment take permanent root for these children. Parents who are seriously committed to helping a troubled and challenged child thrive will vastly increase their odds of success by making a fundamental policy decision to slow down their lives and put their child's needs first. Joining the Women's League can wait for a few years. This youngster can't. That's that's profound, Karen, because I'm thinking, hearing this, um, 
do you have what it takes? That's the Mm -hmm. question the parent asks. And my sense is that parents who knock on your door are already, they've already completed the adoption process. Is that correct? Most of the time. (laughs) Most of them have. So perhaps with all good intentions, they have reached out in love and went through all this effort and, and found the child to bring into their home. And now after the fact, they may be asking the question, she's here. Do I have what it takes? Because Mm -hmm. this is a lot more challenging than I, than Mm -hmm. I thought. Mm -hmm. Um, But you're so positive in this book. What I'm hearing the message through this book is that with a skill set built of your own, Mm -hmm. yes, you have what it takes. Yes, absolutely, Annie. I think that parents who are beginning to question their journey, they have what it takes. They're just going to have to dig deep into the well of who they are. They're going to have to slow down all the noise. They're going to have to slow down all the clutter. They're going to have to make pretty radical life changes for their pace. And once we slow down, and once we kind of look with new eyes, so this behavior means a need. A a behavior means an unmet need. So what does that behavior say this child is asking me for? How can I give it? I know I can do this. Mm-hmm. We, we actually have some parents who'll say, you know, I don't want to send my child away from me because they're, I don't want them to feel they're being bad. But sometimes I'll say, you know what? Mama needs to go think about this a minute. Can I come right back? A <laughs> much better way to frame it. I need yes. a break. <laughs> That's right. I'm in time out. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, the idea of having what it takes uh, it makes me wonder how long you've been doing this work and do you have the kind of um, time frame to be able to say, here are some success stories of, of people because we've tracked them for long enough to know that not only did the parents have what it take, but we've got we've got some wonderful family stories here because the, the kids who came from these hard places are now doing very well. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I actually started this journey myself as a foster mother almost 40 years ago. Ah. So before I came back to get my PhD, and, and that was only about 11 years ago, before, when my baby boy left for college, I came back for my advanced degree. But, but in the years that we've worked with families, we have seen, for example, um, the little child in that, in that story that you mentioned earlier um, go from looking quite psychiatric as just a little bit of a thing. She was just a young child with multiple psychiatric diagnoses. And inside of a period of very few weeks, there's dramatic gains. But the trick is for the parents to know those dramatic gains are like the gains of a little baby, a newborn being cold, and the mother warms that baby. If the mother stops giving a blanket and food, that baby's ability to get food and warmth on their own are not existent, right? So mm-hmm. when we get these right. huge growth spurts with the children, we have parents who say, well, he's doing great. I say, whoa, 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 he doesn't have the brain development right now. You are right now still the external modem. Um so it it will take a period of sustained months, on average one month per one year of age, of of soaking that child with what they need. But you'll see dramatic gains. I, I reread a letter this morning from a 16-year-old I worked with in a residential facility. And in the year before I worked with her, they had 70 violent episodes on record. So on average from every her. five days on her, just this one girl. Okay. She was busy, huh? (laughs) She was a very busy girl. And actually, they were preparing to send her back to a mental hospital because she was just beyond the means. They had other kids to serve, like nearly 100 kids to serve, all high-risk kids. And I went and did a training for a week with her parents and her staff. And it was six weeks after I left before she had another episode. And that episode, she was able to, what we call, use her words, use words, mm-hmm. give me your words, not your behaviors. Um, within a period of a, of a week, she made dramatic gains and within a period of six weeks, but it was six months before she even began to have the full brain development to support her behavior. And it was actually another, almost another 10 months before she could do it consistently, consistently, consistently on her own. 
I've also worked with kids all over the world who are diagnosed with bipolar, which you probably know is a diagnosis du jour for a child who's at risk. Yes. And very often when we work with a child diagnosed as bipolar, we teach the parent these strategies. We teach them how to be an external modem, like the mother of a newborn, the daddy of a newborn. You have to regulate them in the beginning with a lot of support. And over time, they take up more and more responsibility. But when we teach families these strategies and when they use those strategies that you've talked about in the book, we see a year later the child doesn't have a psychiatric diagnosis diagnosis left. And that is because the child's brain has matured in ways and their brain chemistry and, and in the context of this loving relationship, their capacity to trust has been enlarged. And so that radical gear shifting and highs and lows and uh, explosive volatile behavior dissipates into, I, I think of one beautiful little girl we served, Annie. She was from uh, adopted from China. Beautiful, beautiful little girl. At four was very violent. It was beating up her seven-year-old brother and attacking her mother. When her daddy was, wouldn't be at home, she'd attack just the mother and the brother. And... Um, in the beginning, she would just pound on her mother and pummel her. And after her mom had been doing the things we would talk about for uh, several weeks, the little one would lie in her arms. I got a letter from the mother saying, now when she's really upset and I hold her, I ask, can I hold her? And, and she'll say yes, and she'll get into my arms, and I'll cradle her and start rocking her, and she'll start crying, and she'll say, I really, really want to hit you, Mommy. <laughs> well, you know, that's great, you know. I'm still angry about this, but I'm going to use my words. Oh, wow. You know? What progress. Yes. Okay, well, this bipolar thing just brings up something for me because it's, um, I don't know if there are, quote, real bipolar cases or, as you say, diagnosis du jour. But if the parent's behavior can ameliorate Absolutely. this condition, what about kids who've been diagnosed as bipolar who are not adopted? Could their parents' behavior shift positively affect them. Absolutely, they can. Absolutely, they can. Now, I mean, obviously, we know that there's a genetic predisposition to a fragile brain chemistry, mm -hmm. but we also know that prenatal insults, so I've seen many children with psychiatric diagnoses who were in adoring homes, and every time I see that, I ask the mother about the prenatal period, and most always, I have a, a horror story mm -hmm. from prenatally. Um, my, my, my one mother whose daughter was eight and terribly, terribly violent, a darling, precious, loving mother and a very supportive, loving daddy. And but but when she was pregnant with this little girl, mm -hmm. her baby sister was in a car wreck. Her This mm -hmm. mother's little sister was in a car wreck and, and they and her life hung in the balance for weeks while. They determined would she live or die, and they kept calling him to the hospital. She's dying, and then they'd say, no, she, she's going to make it go home. Well, that's how that baby's brain formed, on the mother's crisis brain chemistry. Mm. So we have, we have parents with, with biological children, when these children may look unstable, that external modem thing, and the wool baby, give me words, I am listening. Um, mm. the same skills work for that child. Because you know what? A child from a difficult pregnancy or who had a birth trauma or early medical trauma, those are kids from the hard places too. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. It's all so fascinating to me. And, um, you know, my focus is often on tweens and teens. And I'm thinking during that period when they are developmentally moving away from parents and home towards peer group. If you've got a kid at that point who is probably less responsive than a four-year-old to cuddling. Yes, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I'm wondering, do you ever work with teens so that you can give them directly these tools so it's not as um, imperative that the parents go along with the program? It absolutely works with teens, and absolutely we do. Now, like just like, for example, the thing you've talked about for like the cuddling and the rocking, obviously we can't do, but we can go bicycling together. We can sit in a backyard swing together, which can be a grown-up kid mm. thing. You know, 
with an older child, they've got the biological drive to move away towards independence, but they don't have the brain development to support independence. Right. And they certainly, certainly don't have the life skills to no. create and maintain healthy peer That's relationships. Right. That's right. So here's what we ask parents to do. Think about a bridge, uh, some kind of a bridge tool. So think about, I had a dad with an adolescent uh, son, 14, 15 years old, who was just, um, who was, who's an adopted child and who had did not have the brain development because of early trauma and abuse to, to be a 16-year-old. Um, and so I said, what does this boy adore? What can you become? What can be a bridge to bring him back to you doing something that still gives him independence? Mm-hmm. And he said, well, he loves cars. And I said, is there any chance you could buy an old junker and build it together? And he said, yes. Uh-huh. And that's exactly what they did. I said to the mother, a mother who had a 14-year-old teenager who was um, from a hard place and who was in a profound depression, I said, tell me something that her eyes light up about when she talks about it. And the mom said she used to love to go play with the children at the homeless shelter um, and the battered women's shelter. And I said, can you be, you use that as a bridge. Don't send her, but go with her. You're letting her move into independence, but you're going with her. You're sharing it with her. While you still give her these tools. This is so hopeful. I love books that are hopeful and give <laughs> parents. Because, because, you know, inactivity, if, if, if we fail to act in, when these children are so needy, what are we launching into the world as the next generation of young adults? Oh, yeah. Oh, so sobering. It's a sobering proposition, isn't it, Annie? It is. You know, I don't know if I've told you about the piece of research, one piece that I think is so powerful for parents to keep in mind. About a year and a half ago now, a study was published with uh, uh, an author who took 57 children with psychiatric diagnoses. These were kids who had been fostered or adopted. And he did a developmental scale that's very comprehensive to get their developmental age. So 57 children, when they averaged the ages of the children chronologically, mm-hmm. the children were nine years, nine months of age. So if you had a child who's virtually a 10-year-old, Annie, in mm-hmm. this sample of kids, make a wild guess what their developmental age was. <laughs> Is that a trick four, question? Uh, three or four? <laughs> You're exactly right. Four years, four months. Uh-huh. So chronologically... And developmentally, so the mother of this 10-year-old may be saying, you're acting like a baby. You're acting like a four-year-old. That's right. And in reality, that's what his brain development will support. Wow. So that gives parents, I think, a lot of grace because you can say, oh, I'm off the hook. You know, I would carry a copy of that article around, pass it around to the babysitters, to the grandmothers, to the school teachers. So, you know, my, my child was not protected in their early development. I am protecting them now, but they have special needs. And I'm asking you to be my advocate and my ally in meeting their needs. And one of those things is going to be, you're going to have to understand a few special things about my child. Does, does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Now, that brings up one other question. What about the school and the role of teachers in this, in this whole picture? Mm, It's a huge role. And I have to tell you, I have said many times, unfortunately, for some of our kids, public school or school in in general is the last frontier for the at-risk child. We've got a a set of teachers who are hard-pressed to make good test scores for their kids. They've got a room of 20, 30, or more squirming children who need to learn something. And they've got this at-risk child or several at-risk children who need all of everything they can give. So it's, it's a lot to ask them to buy into what we can do at home. But here's what we tell parents to do. Think of three things. Choose three things that are most helping you at home. And take to the teacher maybe a chapter if your child has sensory issues, maybe one of the chapters from Carol Kranowitz's book on your child at school. There's a great chapter on the needs of a child and how they can be met at school if they have sensory processing problems. Or maybe there's a chapter on fear, that chapter that you that you mentioned with mm-hmm. the little girl in hunger, chapter four of our book. Anybody can download it free on our website. It's available online uh, if they don't have the book. And and just take one thing and say, look, we've realized our child has a sensory issue, for example, or a fear issue from their history. And so here's three things that we have found are really helpful. And give them three discrete tools. Don't overwhelm them with a lot to read or a lot of DVDs to watch. Don't overwhelm them with too many requests, but just give them enough 
to get them to begin to have success. I get reports from parents all the time saying the teachers are ecstatic. And not only are they using those three skills with the child they've been asked to use them with, they're using them with great success with the classroom. <laughs> Well, that that kind of fits in with what I said about the the um, find out the emotion behind the behavior. That's something that you can generalize to any parent yes, in any absolutely situation. Absolutely right. So you've given the teachers a gift as well by absolutely. giving them this information. <laughs> absolutely, and, and you know my experience with teachers is that they're there because they want to teach, but but unfortunately, academic systems have become such that there's so much emphasis on te- test taking. Yes. That the kind of creativity and playful things that teachers were able to do in the past are really more limited now. So our, our, parent, our, our parents have to be compassionate for the teachers. We hope the teachers will be compassionate for the parents and that they can become a strong team as advocates for this child. Advocates for the child. That's what it's all about. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, thank you so much for writing this book, Karen. It's brilliant. My guest, my guest today has been Dr. Karen Purvis. Her book is The Connected Child for Parents Who Have Welcomed Children from Other Countries and Cultures, from Troubled Backgrounds, Children with Special Behavioral or Emotional Needs. Karen, you're a hero in my eyes. Thank you. Bless you so much. Thank you. And tell me, please, before we sign off, where our listeners can get more information about you and the work that you do. Well, you know, our website is loaded with lots of materials. It's www.child.tcu.edu, and there are articles there, and there are other materials there that are available, readily available. And then there's another website that we've partnered with a faith-based organization, and there are materials for faith-based uh, families. It's on www.empowered to connect. Dot org and there's a lot of downloadables there we've we've tried on both of those websites to make scientifically solid and research based information readily available to families who are looking for empowerment with their children thank you we'll have those links on our website when we post this this podcast thanks again for your time Karen thanks and Annie good luck thank you you too bye bye now I'm Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. To learn more about my work with parents and teens, visit me at AnnieFox.com. And tune in next week for our next podcast for Family Confidential. And until then, happy parenting! Happy parenting!